okay. It's too much. It's too much love. I can't. I'm so overwhelmed. Well, hello, ladies. Wow. I'm going to get right to it because it's about to be a very impactful lesson here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some stuff. I'm going to share some personal stuff. No, I'm excited. I, I, I just love how God is so sovereign. And so in the moment when I get asked to preach, it's my moments where I'm, like, really wrestling with God. So I'm like, this is perfect because I get to now share my heart. And I know that for sure everybody is going through the same thing in some sort of level. But, you know, last week, or not last week, last Women's Midweek, uh, Regine did an incredible lesson. And it was about being a woman who fears the Lord. And if you can't remember that lesson, definitely go back and listen to it. And it just, she provided so many great uh, practicals. But uh, immediately she was coming back and asking for feedback. And I said, uh, uh, and what she thought, what I thought about the lesson. And I was like, mm, this is some, this is a lesson that us sisters, we need to marinate in. You know what I mean? We need to sit on it for a little bit. Because I want to make sure that that lesson didn't, you know, go over our heads. Because it's so important to really, really know and how, how do we fear the Lord. And there is this, uh, this book. If you know me, I'm always recommending this book. And it's called uh, Captivating. Get the book. It's amazing. Uh, long story short, it really gives you the, the key in a sense of, unlocking and restoring your your womanhood in the eyes of God and the key of restoring that is to not give way to fear it's all about that and in the way how she just articulates to like uh, about the woman's heart it's it's incredible but it uh part of it finishing this book it inspired me to write this lesson um but also another of my inspirations I know my husband watches all the lessons so I'm going to share this to the camera but I'm really grateful for him because if you know Matt well, <laughs> um, he truly, 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 he does not allow fear to dominate him. You know, the moment he, he has, is fearful of something, he just attacks it. It's incredible. One of the things was actually swimming. <laughs> Uh, it does not like women. And, uh, but he decided, he asked one of the older brothers, um, Jim Fenton, uh, to take him to the ocean and learn how to swim. I mean, not the swimming pool, right? Uh, but to the ocean, right? Uh, but take it to the ocean to learn how to float in the deep ends. And they went there every Friday morning for a couple of months. And finally, Matt learned how to swim in the deep ocean. And it was awesome. And it just, it just inspired me, but it also brought me to a sober reality about us as, as women. See, what I have a watch is that my husband conquers his fears, but you can't conquer what you don't acknowledge. So he doesn't act like he isn't afraid. That's not like him, but he just doesn't allow the fear to dictate his life. And it's just it taught me the, the first step to conquering our fears and having no other fear than God. Uh, then, other than God, but we need to learn how to acknowledge this and attack it so we don't allow fear to take our lives. So there's an incredible scripture in Proverbs 20, verse 5. You can write it down. Proverbs 20, verse 5, but it says, The purpose of a person's heart is deep waters, and the one who has insight draws it out. I love it. I love how it describes. I mean, I, I remember when I first time uh, studying the Bible, and someone showed me the scripture, and they're like, yeah, the Bible's like over 2,000 years old, and it still, it still can address to the human heart. And it's so true. Like, when you think about the, the ocean, it's, it's, it's so scary, you know? And it's, it's incredible how we know more about space than the actual ocean, but it's the same thing about our, our hearts. God says that our hearts is deep waters, and there's just some things that we don't know about our hearts. But the one who has insight like God, he's the one who has the great wisdom to learn how to draw out our hearts. What is going on? And I hope that is my goal, that we can be able to acknowledge maybe the certain fears in your hearts. 
Maybe those deep waters. What is it that's preventing you from being able to be a woman to reverence God? And also, that we're not consumed by it as well. So, my uh, title is uh, A Woman Who Fears the Lord Part (laughs) 2. Inspired by incredible leader, Regine. But my first point here is a woman consumed by fear. Dun, dun, dun. So, turn with me to Genesis 16. We're going to dive into one of my favorite, favorite, favorite stories, and I will share in later on in the lesson. But Genesis 16, please say amen when you get there. Genesis 16. <laughs> All right, verse 1. Now, um, for those who aren't familiar, we're going about to endure, uh, read the story about Sarah, but um, her first name was Sarai. And uh, if, you don't, if you don't know why, study that out for later, okay? Um, but this is Sarah before, and in verse 1, it says, Now Sarai and Abram's wife had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. She must have been a really convincing woman. She said, so after Abram had been living in Canaan uh, 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her, uh, her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. She knew she was pregnant. She began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is besides the road of Shur. And she said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? Where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he'll live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen and uh, the one who sees me. That is why uh, the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Berid. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the son Ishmael to the son. So she had born. What's up there? Wow. We're going to break it down a little bit. We're going to break it down. But we're about to, you know, dissect the story of these two women, Hagar and Sarai. And the topic, of this, obviously, in this lesson is about fear. And we're going to dissect a little bit of these two women, of Hagar and Sarai, because they both function out of fear. Now, <clears throat> I found my notes here. But right here, it just talks about that one of the things that you, you're going to see throughout the story is that they really desired something, Right? But we're going to dissect a little bit of the decisions that they made to get that one thing. And due to the uncertainty that both of them were in, it produced fear of what could, uh, what could be um, that are they enough? Are they living up to the standard of being a woman in their eyes? These questions within both of their hearts produce two different responses. Just like I believe tonight, there are two different types of women. You know, I pray that you have the faith when I say this. Some of you are like, yeah, yeah, I agree. But there are going to be some of you in this room that probably don't see it just yet. So please have the faith when I say this. That each one of you guys want unfailing love. 
That's a fact because it's in the Bible. <laughs> it's in Proverbs 19, verse 22. If you don't believe me, write it down. Proverbs 19, verse 22. But it says a person's desire is unfailing love. To be loved without conditions. Don't, don't, don't tell me you don't want that. Right? I know, but us as women, like, where do we, where do we find that? You know, we, we desire love by being valued in our families, in our friendships, um, maybe with our boyfriends, in our marriage, in our job, from status to title. Uh, maybe the way we want our kids and how to see it. Uh, but why, why these things? You know, because ultimately we want to be loved and accepted. And we try, we, we find value in these things. And these things is the ways how we validate that value, right? And so tonight I, wanna, I want us to put ourselves in the, the sandals of these women here, right? And because also in Romans uh, 12, verse 3, write that down, it says, for by the grace given uh, me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. This is so important. Ladies, do you have sober judgment on yourself? Right? Let's figure out. Let's see if we can find ourselves in the story here. But there's two types of women here. The dominating woman and the desolate woman. So we're first going to explore Sarai. She is the dominating woman. And part of this was inspired of what I read in the book Captivating. And she really uh, um, dissects of what, what is a dominating woman and what do they function by? What kind of fear? But <clears throat> right here, Sarai, she obviously, you know, in the previous chapters, God promised them that they were going to have a kid. But it's already over 10 years and she's waiting on for that promise. So what does she decide to do? Take matters in her own hands. And she goes to her husband, and obviously she was pretty persuasive because her husband's like, sure, I'll, I'll do it. But we're going to see a, the result of that. But when it comes to the dominating woman, I'm going to read a, a little short paragraph here and, and how she defines it. But it says, she needs no one. She's in charge, on top of things constantly. She's a woman who knows how to get what she wants. Some of us might admire that, but consider this. There's nothing merciful about her, nothing tender, and certainly nothing vulnerable. She has forsaken essential uh, aspects of her femininity. Wow. This fear completely destroyed Sarai. And it, it describes that. You see that, like, it's, it's amazing. Now, here's the thing. Study out Sarah. She had her high. She had her low. She was human, y'all, okay? <laughs> but in this part, it, her, her fear totally took over her, totally consumed her, right? Because all of a sudden, later on, she just becomes so unmerciful. And the way how she treated Hagar and her, hus her husband, it's horrible. But you see that when she was... <laughs> I think it's so funny, but when Hagar finally is pregnant and she finds out, she has the audacity to tell her husband, you are responsible of my suffering. It, 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 it truly exposed the deep waters of her heart. It brought out that fear, right? Um, but she, again, she didn't take ownership and she decided to blame and project that fear onto others. And it's sad right here, like even from uh, Abraham's response, he was like, do whatever you think, right? And I realized that reading the scriptures is when we are pushy and, and we insist on our ways, the people in our lives who are trying to lead us, they may have the same response because you can't be led. You don't give room to people lead you. And so maybe there's a part of Abraham, he's like, yeah, do whatever you want. Because Sarah in this moment could not be uh, persuaded. She was set on that, right? But since women, uh, women this type can believe that, you know, that we know the best and what's the point of people trying to lead them. But I really want to dissect of here, like, okay, well, what are the symptoms? How do I know I'm a dominating woman, just like in this story, okay? 
So take, take those notes. <laughs> <clears throat> so right here it says, maybe you don't listen because of how something is said versus what was said. Right? You think you should have been the leader. You think you already know what the advice is going to be so you don't get any. You don't, um, you got open to God and uh, discipled yourself and already repented. So what's the point of confessing to others, right? I already talked to God. It's between me and God. It's just between me and God, right? Even though you messed up because they messed up too or they mess, uh, messed up first, you don't have to be the righteous or spiritual or respectful. I think, you know, as a wife, this also convicted me too, I think for wives, is this how you can be in your marriage, you know? Or maybe it's with your discipler, your parents, your teachers, whoever is leading you. But ultimately, it's towards God. You know, there's a scripture, write it down in Proverbs 19, verse 3. But it says, a person's own fully leads to your ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Man, there's so many decisions that we make and then we see the end results. And then we end up blaming others and getting critical of others. But you got to ask, how did you get yourself in that situation? You know, we can get at mad, but the reality is it was because of your lack of faith and not being humble and taking advice or instructions. So here, Sarai, um, we are when, when we let fear and arrogance blind our judgment, when you feel the need to take control, you feel the need to save the day, be the hero, so it won't fall apart, you, something that helps me indicate when I want to take control is to indicate I'm fearful. That's what it is, right? And so other things, too, that I realize <clears throat> when I'm running off of, of fear, but sometimes I just know it, um, is when uh, I constantly feel that, that the need to be doing something, right? Because you, you don't want to be seen as lazy, uh, lazy or unproductive uh, to others or you're trying to prove something to yourself. You're, you're more mainly being active and not proactive, always trying to be busy. Um, or when you have the chance for someone to uh, you have the chance to take the reins, but you're like, no, only I can lead this because I want this perfect, right? You're so afraid of failure. So you don't go and ask for help. You just take it on, right? I think a big one, and I've seen this in me as well, is you are the one who are slow to listen but, but quick to speak. <laughs> in Proverbs 18, uh, verse 12, it says, before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but uh, humility comes before honor. To answer before li uh, listening, that is folly and shame. Thinking you know what should be said before you listen is prideful, but also foolish. We need to hum be humble and stop with the, the arrogant thoughts and the critical thoughts, you know. Um, but another symptom could be when God's plan goes against what you think is right or more effective way, you, you, you struggle. You're more focused on being right than being righteous. And here's the thing, guys, like, <clears throat> don't swing the pendulum when you're hearing this and be like, all right, fine, I'm, I'm not going to add my opinions. I'm not going to, you know, take charge anymore. No, 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 no. When you go back to the story here, God wanted to use Sarah, just not the way that she thought. He wanted her faith and true faith that involves actually giving her full heart and trusting God. Sarah was a woman who looked at things practically and desired to solve problems in the most effective way. But what lacked was faith. It was layered with insecurity. The domineering women wants to be needed and used. But when we aren't, we tend to rely on ourselves rather than faith, the things that are unseen. Is this you tonight? Really reflect on that, ponder in that. Is this you? You know, I, I, I although it's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a lot of things. Maybe you're checking off the box like, oh my gosh, this is me, this is me. How do I change? Study out Sarah because she's incredible. Because if you write down Hebrews 11, 11, 
she was actually in the Hall of Fame. She, it says, it stated that she considered him faithful. She considered God faithful, who made the promise. She repented. It's amazing. It's amazing. And later on in the book of Peter, it talks about how uh, Peter calls the, the women to be like Sarah, right? Don't give way to fear. And there are many, many situations where Sarah was put in a rough spot and she did not give way to fear. But you guys are the dominant women. They're powerful when you're pointed at the wrong, right direction, right? You're powerful. Like, God wants to use you. You guys are the, the leaders. And, like, you guys are the ones who can run things. It's, it's amazing. I admire your, your confidence. But I think I want to remind you in Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, it talks about that we can't lean on our own understanding, we can't make uh, uh, decisions based off our own judgment. We need to learn how to filter, out, filter all of that through the Bible. That's what we need to do. We need to, it says like in Proverbs 3, to submit all your ways to God. That is what you need to do. And God can do even greater things just like Sarah. So she repented. And you guys can repent too. It's amazing. But now we're going to look at the second woman here the uh, desolate woman. And, uh, you know, when I look at these two, I'm going to share a little bit more. I'm like, for me, my heart goes out more to, to Hagar. But I'm like, man, I, I, I'm the, the desolate woman. But the, the word desolate here, it means deserted of people and in a state of bleak and dismal, dismal emptiness. Ooh, that's rough. Um, but I'm going to read one of the sections here about the desolate woman. And uh, <clears throat> she's pretty, she's pretty um, you know, don't take this personally, but I'll, I'll explain what she means by this. But she's pretty uh, uh, straightforward with her words. Uh, but it says, the desolate woman is needy and far too vulnerable. Right? <laughs> I know. That's why I said, hold on, okay? Um, <laughs> she's naive lost, and lost the sense of herself. And she can may fall under the abuse of a bad man. And <clears throat> I know. I'll explain. I'll explain later, guys. Um, <clears throat> but she basically, she's talking about here to give you context that sometimes we can allow people to, like, walk all over us because we're too afraid to say something. That was the context. I should have told you that. But <laughs> it says the desolate women, they're ruled by the aching abyss within them. They want to be seen. They're consumed by a hunger for a relationship. A desolate woman also tends to hide her true self, right? They're so, although they, they so badly want a relationship, they choose to risk relationships and not build relationships at all. It's the most interest, interesting thing, but I've seen this personally in my life as well. But... Basically, desolate women, they're, they're runners. They're the ones who not just physically run away, but also they check out emotionally and mentally. If you're trying to figure out if you're the desolate woman, I got some symptoms for you right here. But it says, you think your words don't matter, so you don't speak up during Bible talk when they ask questions. You think your words don't matter, so you don't share good news. Or in any group settings. You just, you, you just think that your people don't want to hear you, you know. You wait for someone to ask you how you're really doing because you already feel like a burden if you go out of your way to tell someone how you're really feeling. Your heart is to help others or the church, but you take yourself out thinking that you're not needed. You stay busy at family gatherings or parties you couldn't avoid, so you're just not trying to make conversation at all. But like, oh, I just need to help the clean. I just need to go. I'm going to go clean the dishes. Um, if you catch me doing that, call me out because I've done that. Um, I think uh, you look for the fault in people to validate the lie in your mind that people don't care. So you're like, well, she never calls me. Or every time I see her, she makes this face. You know, or she doesn't give me a hug. She, she, she doesn't care about me. But you look for the flaws in some people to validate that that person doesn't care about you. 
Have they even told you that? But you somehow made that assumption. When you sin, you're too ashamed to get open because you're more afraid of what people will think of you, so you hide. It's just like the story of Eve when she took in the forbidden fruit in Genesis 3, verse 10. It says that she hid from God. You know, right here, and um, I'm going to read another. She really, she really nails the dot of a desolate woman. Um, and when I first read this, I was, I was crying. This book will make you cry. But it says, fallen Eve controls her relationship. She refuses to be vulnerable. And if, uh, and if she cannot secure her relationships, then she kills her heart's longing for intimacy so that she will be safe and in control. She becomes a woman who doesn't need anyone, especially a man. How this plays out over the course of her life and how the wounds of her childhood shapes her heart's convictions are often a complex story, one worth knowing. But beneath it all, behind it all, it's a simple truth. Women dominate and control because they fear the vulnerability. Far from God and far from Eden, it seems uh, perfectly reasonable to live. But consider also this, whatever is not from faith, it is sin. We protect ourselves in that way. It's, an, it's, it's pretty, pretty convicting. Let me read one more because it's just good. I, I don't know. Do you want to hear some more? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. But <clears throat> we hide behind our makeup. <laughs> this, this is for me. We hide behind our humor. Yep, that's a lot of us. We hide with angry silences and punishing withdrawals. We hide, we hide our truest self and offer only what we believe is wanted, what is safe. We act in self-protective ways and refuse to offer what we truly see, believe, and know. We will not risk rejection or looking like a fool. We have spoken in the past and have been met with blank stares and mocking. We will not do it again. We hide because we're afraid. We have been wounded and wounded deeply. People have sinned and sinned against us, and we, are, we have sinned as well. To hide means to remain safe, to hurt less. At least that's what we think. Wow. Hiding, running is a form of control. We control the rejection. We control the abandonment. We control who hurts us. How? By not allowing people close to our hearts. And the story here at Hagar, I mean, it's, it's a very unfortunate situation. Do not give me, don't, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, it's sad. I cannot imagine what she went through, being a slave and being forced to be intimate with a man and uh, being mistreated by, by Sarah. It's, it's a horrible situation, but I think we can, we can learn spiritual meanings from this because there's, we've always been in a, in a place of our lives where we just, we just don't want to be in. But how do we respond? And the desolate woman here she runs away. She runs away from the problem. But I love in the story and how, how God meets her halfway and meets her in the desert. And he's like, obviously God knows, but he's like, what are you doing? Where are you coming from? And I love the story here because, man, I get emotional. I remember the first time the, when I read this story because I was like, wow. Like, she's like, you're the God who sees me. You know me, the ins and the outs. It's incredible. She felt seen. She felt needed. And God gave her this great promise. She said, it, I'm pretty sure it inspired her to do something great. But Hagar wasn't going to receive the blessing until she went back from what she was running from. Ladies, the very blessing you want from God is probably the one thing you've been avoiding. Go back to what you're avoiding. Maybe that's where your prayers will be answered. Imitate this from Hagar. But the reality is that their, cir uh, their circumstances may be different. Their personalities may be different. But their circumstances brought them to the same place. Sarah wasn't satisfied by her taking control, right? But Hagar was left feeling like she couldn't move. She had no power and all hope was lost when she ran to the desert. But both of the, the women here, they felt stuck, 
powerless and unfulfilled in the hopes of having unfailing love and desires. But God is very sovereign in what he uh, allows things to uh, happen in your life. It's incredible. Because they, they were brought in the same place. And it reminds me of the scripture in Hosea 2, verse 6. Um, you can write that down. I'm going to read it for the sake of time here. It says, uh, therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so she cannot find her way. She will chase after her lovers but not catch them. She will look for them but not find them. Where have you been running to? Are you, you feel like you're in the same place? There may be a reason why. There's a quote here that says that Jesus has to throw us too. Throw, it means to, um, to prevent, to stop you. Um, but I hear it says, throw also self-redemptive plans or controlling or hiding Throughout the ways we are seeking to feel the ache within us. Otherwise, we have never fully turned to him for our rescue. And so if you're feeling stuck, you're feeling frustrated, maybe you hit a plateau in your relationship with God. And you keep realizing that God's teaching you the, the same spiritual lesson. God has brought you to the point where you have uh, exhausted all that you have within your power. And he's asking you, have you had enough yet? Will we, will we turn to him for our refuge and also fulfill that desire of unfailing love? Maybe it's been like that for days. Maybe it's been like that for weeks. Maybe for you guys, it's been for years. But ladies, I want to ask you, and you, you got to really think about this. Have you been making your decisions out of faith or have you been making your decisions out of fear? Think about that. You know, I, what helps me when I was doing this lesson, I was thinking about my family. In this lesson, it, this is not just for us, but think about, think about the women in your family. Maybe your mom, maybe your sister, maybe your auntie, maybe your grandma. You know, it says that the scripture says um, that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. And I come from a family where I look at the women and I see where they're at now. And it's sad. It's sad. <laughs> the decisions that they made, it, it, it got them to a place of feeling burnt out, feeling confused, right? Feeling like they have no purpose. Feeling like they're not, they're not seen. Like, look at your family. Learn from the women. Maybe, I, I know you guys are thinking about somebody. Learn from them. Where has their decisions uh, resulted in, right? Some of the women, a lot of the women in my family, they're so uh, alone. And it's just sad that, you know, those, the, whether those who are trying to control or those who were trying to push away people, they still end up the same results. It's sad. It's sad when we allow fear to consume us. It takes everything out of us. It's exhausting. It takes out of you like emotionally and mentally, physically and spiritually. We got to learn to not, not make decisions out of fear. It's going to get us nowhere. And even, well, actually, I take that back. It could get you somewhere. But even in the success, just like Sarah, her plan worked out. She got the baby, but you see that she wasn't fully satisfied. That's important. You know, one of the challenges that Regine gave last midweek, she said to write something down, uh, something or someone that you fear uh, more than God. Did you do it? Did you do the challenge? I did. I did the challenge, and I'm going to share it. <laughs> I wrote down vulnerability. Yep. Now, here's the thing. It may, some of you, it may shock you because um, I'm words affirmation. That's my love language. So uh, a lot of comments that I get is, like, I'm known to be very vulnerable. And I'm grateful because, like, I've definitely gone after it. I've, like, grown in it. Um, but I've been a lot more smarter in how to put limits to my vulnerability. Um, I just know just when to stop to make you think I'm being vulnerable, but I'm actually not being very vulnerable. 
So as a sister before you, I'm going to repent in that. Um, but one of the things that I realized that God has exposed when I was just studying out vulnerability, it's, I mean, study it out. I don't want to get down the rabbit hole. Uh, vulnerability is so powerful. It's amazing. But um, I realized that where it was being exposed was in my relationships. You know, I wasn't really good at building relationships in the past. So it was one of the things, like, I radically went after the past, like, couple of years. And now what's the result? I have really awesome friends. <laughs> Now, hold on. I, I have awesome friends. I have incredible spiritual moms and dads and aunties and uncles. It's awesome to be close to people, but now I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid of losing them. That was one of the reasons why I didn't build relationships. It was so hard for me to admit that that I don't like people being close to my heart. It's scary. And it, it, it exposed the deep water of my heart. I was like, oh my gosh, I thought I was over this. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was exposed uh, recently. Uh, it's gonna be my birthday very soon. And uh, praise God for another year, but um, uh, all my friends are incredible, and they're like, yeah, well, what are we going to do for your birthday? And each one of them are like, yeah, we want to celebrate you. Uh, we want to adore you. We want to, like, we want to just be with you. And I'm, I was so overwhelmed. I was like, and then, my, well, you know what I said? I said, I want to be alone. <laughs> and I, for a couple of days, I was so, like, I convinced myself that it's better to celebrate my birthday alone because that, that's just what I need. It, it was incredible how my pride just totally clouded my judgment. But I kept telling them, I was like, yeah, I wanted to, I want to be alone. You know, birthdays are not a big deal. I don't really care. I, I just want to just do the things that I want to do. And, um, but I didn't realize, you know, but the thing is that, if I can just be honest, I just, I don't, I don't want to make good memories. I don't want to make good memories. Because I'm, I'm afraid to look back and be like, oh, I, I, I miss those days, you know. I don't want to lose people. <laughs> That's the reality. And it's, it's so interesting. It's, it's actually so wicked of me. It's so sick that although I, I so badly want relationships, I always go back to being isolated because I find comfort in that. It's, you know, it, it's, it's my safe zone. That's what the Bible talks about. I feel safe there. Just being alone, that's how I take control. I reject myself first. I isolate myself first so that no one could leave me. That's what I've, I've learned. And I thought I can share a, a journal entry um, because in the, the challenge, um, uh, Regine said to pick a scripture, to share your victory, to go after it. But this is my journal. It, it's, it, it's things that I don't share. That's why it's my journal. Um, but I thought, why not? Why not share this? Where is this coming from? <laughs> but I wrote this. Um, and please, if you like grammar, I'm just, you know, um, don't, don't come after me. This is my journal. But this is what I expressed. I said, I don't think I actually express how I actually feel. <laughs> I don't think I have been thoroughly, I mean, thorough about my feelings. Like, I, I, I'm so sad. I feel so vulnerable saying that. But I still cry like a little girl who really misses their dad. I really miss my dad. Rejection is so painful. It's so painful. I think... I really suppress my emotions, and little by little, I let it out. But I'm really sad. Like, my dad disowned me. My Abba, my Baba disowned me. How do I respond righteously? How do I respond faithfully? This hurts so much. This hurts so much. And it's odd because despite what he has done, I still love him. It's the little girl in me that continues to have hope. And I pray that I can have rest. I'm crying so much because it hurts so much. 
But remember Jesus, Selma, <laughs> the one who can empathize with you in every single way, the one who can empathize with your weaknesses. The Lord says, never will I forsake you, never I will leave you. Remember that. Romans 8, you have the spirit where you can scream out, Abba, you have no more of the spirit of fear. Selma, you have your true father. Remember that. He is your Abba. That is your true Abba. I'm going to stop here because it's, it's a lot. But that was one of my journals. You know, I don't, I thought I could share that, you know, because I know a lot of you can relate. <laughs> um, but I didn't realize that my fear of rejection and abandonment really dictate my decisions. Terrible. And I was like, okay, I got to pick my pain. Either the pain of loneliness and always desiring a deep relationship or the pain that comes with uh, uh, deep relationships or the thought of losing someone. But when I thought about Jesus, I, I thought there was a quote that says, the depth you love is equal to the willingness of your pain, for your pain. And I think about the cross. He loved us so much that he was willing to endure all that pain for us. And so, ladies, if you didn't do that challenge, do it. It helped my heart so much. P write that down. What is the one thing you're avoiding? Pick that scripture. Do it afraid. Share your victory. And then repeat it until you get to heaven. Amen. <laughs> so with that being said, you know, our fears, they, um, they'll take you far, but uh, they have limits. Fear will take you far. But being consumed and compelled by love will make you limitless. And that's what we need to do. We need to be women that are not motivated by fear, but motivated by grace and love. And so my second and last point is a woman compelled by God's unfailing love. So I'm going to rush here a bit. I'm going to see the time. But God's unfailing love. Unfailing love is, oh, you guys, you, you have to study out for yourself. It's amazing. Um, in other, there's other translations where it says steadfast love, loving kindness, mercies, faithfulness. Uh, I mean, you name it. There's so many words for this unfailing love. And I love the scripture here in Isaiah 50, verse 10. Write it down. It says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Amazing. Psalms 107, verse 43, it says, Let the one who is wise heed these things and ponder the loving deeds of the Lord. Guys, definitely, I have all these scriptures here, but for the sake of time, study out the book of Psalms and highlight every time you see the word unfailing uh, love. It's it's amazing. It helps my heart so much. But the one scripture that I wanted to show you here, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. The solution to all things, 2 Corinthians 5. Let me know when you get there. <laughs> Thanks. 2 Corinthians 5, verse uh, 14. It says, for Christ loves compels us because we are convinced that no one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I love this. Man, Paul, the murderer, who he was so, I mean, he's no more murderer, but he's known in that past. But it's amazing, like, of course, he was so moved by the grace that God has shown him. It says that he was compelled. He's convinced this is what God did for him. And it's amazing what produced and how much he's transformed and the ways how he just impacted the church. It was, it's incredible. Study it out. But I realize that, you know, although that maybe we can falter and maybe that we can fail, his God's love never fails. His love never fails. He, you know, Paul here, he was convinced of this reality. He was compelled to be all God called him to be and do all that God had called him to do. You know, guys, like, I, I hope you understand when I look in this room, each of you guys have incredible talent. 
Each of you guys have incredible value that you can bring to this world, bring into the kingdom. Don't you understand that? You know, I remember when people were like, you have talents, you have, oh my gosh, like, you need to do this, you need to do that. I'm just like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And I'm like, no, like, when, when sisters, they, they compliment you, when sisters tell you you can do something great, I think what helps my heart is to understand it's not from the sister, God's trying to tell you that. We're trying to see that. But you have to understand what, what makes a, a God-fearing woman. When you read God's word and you see those incredible scriptures, you have to make a decision to believe it. <laughs> That's it. You just need to make a decision. Quickly go to Romans 5. Just want to show you the scripture. It's, it's one of my favorite scriptures. Go to Romans 5. Um, but this scripture, for me personally, just shuts down all arguments. In Romans 5, verse 6, it, sees, it says, you see, at just the right time, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrate his own love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, I love this scripture. I love it so much because in, in the moments when you felt powerless, Maybe in the moments where you weren't even thinking about God, before you studied the Bible, before you said, Jesus is Lord, in your worst moments, your darkest moments, it said God tried to, uh, he went out of his way to prove his love, the story of the cross, while you were still sinners. This demonstrates that for the dominating woman, you don't need to fight to prove that you're worth God's love. For the desolate woman, you don't need to hide your true self anymore to be accepted. God already proved that on the cross. It's incredible. There's nothing more you need to do to win God's love. There's nothing more you need to do. Stop fighting. Stop hiding. Just enjoy this, this beautiful grace, this beautiful gift that God has given you, ladies. It too many of us remember your past, remember your Egypt. We were so motivated and consumed by fear. But God has freed you from that. Let's not bring that in the kingdom anymore. We need to show that to the women in the world, what it's like what, to be women, to feel free, to not feel afraid anymore. Be convinced, I pray, ladies, go study this out. Find yourself in the scriptures. Who's the woman that you can relate to here? You know? And go after it. It's amazing when you're truly in touch and the, and the way how uh, God values you. Man, you become limitless. It's amazing. And that's what the, uh, the, the book talks about. Once you understand and, and not to give way to fear, that's when you truly unlock true womanhood. And you truly become the, the woman and the, the masterpiece that God wants you to be. So what's stopping you? You know, if you're a guest and this is your first time here or you're, you're studying the Bible, definitely ask the person, whoever brought you, to study the Bible. But those maybe, maybe you've been studying the Bible for a bit. And maybe you, you, you've hit a little spot where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> I, I, I plead with you and I share this, man. I, I didn't know what my life was going to look like on the other side. But I do not regret the decision to put my full trust in God. And so I plead with you and I encourage you to continue to move forward and, and, and see what it's like, the life, to put your full trust in God. And so, ladies, I close out here. Um, let us not be uh, no more dominant or desolate, but let us be compelled by God's unfailing love. And I share this as Peter shared in the book of Peter. It says, do not give way to fear. I love you guys. Mm -hmm.